so that we understand things that you're actively doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave Yarns. Amen. Thanks, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I recognize that I'm coming uh, and speaking in the middle. Many of you have been fasting and joining us in this time of fasting and prayer for 21 days and just uh, so excited about what God is going to do today. I want to speak to you about a message that I think is very important, the moment of inception for victory, how to recognize it, and how to act. Will you join me in prayer? God, I pray for a touch, Lord. I pray for your grace to come. Lord, I pray for all of us to have hearing ears and, and seeing eyes. Lord, I pray for those that are watching us around the world. Let your grace come in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You know, I'm speaking about the moment of inception for victory. Now, let me be clear. Most people have the ability to recognize victory once it's come to fruition. Uh, you remember the pictures from World War II. You know, world, uh, world War ends. People were uh, acting triumphantly. But there was a point at which that war turned. And the men and women that were in that battle at the deepest, darkest times, something came, something changed, and they realized that victory was on its way. Come on, somebody. A lot of people can see the victory once it comes to its fullness. I'm talking about hearing ears and seeing eyes to recognize that point at which things begin to turn and grabbing it with faith and realizing victory is coming. I want to speak to you like the mature men and women you are. I'm not going to go over every scripture. You, hopefully you have the notes in front of you. If you don't, you can raise your hand. Someone will get them for you. The moment of victory, only a small group can recognize it. But even smaller group have the ability to stand up for it. I want to talk to you about one of those moments in history. Jesus will pick up the story in Luke 22. This is the moment of transition. This is what victory looked like in this situation. You remember, I'll, I'll guide you into the story. Just days before, all the crowds were shouting Hosanna. Amen. They were throwing down uh, palm branches in front of the Lord. Uh, his disciples, one by one, got up and said, Lord, we'll die for you. Come on, somebody, you know to be worried when people start talking like that. They said they'll die for him. They'll never turn back. The crowds uh, were shouting, Hosanna in the highest. And now everything has turned. His disciples are scattered. They're denying that they even knew him. Uh, the people that shouted Hosanna are now shouting crucify him. My, how things can change, how fickle the crowd is. But Jesus comes before uh, the guards that are with him, and you guys have all seen the passion. I don't need to go into it. But at this point, his body is broken beyond recognition. Listen, there's a purpose in his suffering, amen? He was wounded, why? Why? For our, for our transgressions, by his stripes. Now we know the rest of the story, but can you see it? Can you, can you join me in this picture at this time? Because I believe this is going to speak to someone today. Someone is going to recognize that their transition is upon them, and it might not look like a storybook fairy tale. It might look very different, and Jesus is in this setting. You remember, they put a crown of thorns on him. They gave him a purple robe. They mocked him, and they come to this point. It says that the guards that were guarding Jesus made fun of him. They beat him. They covered his eyes. They said, prophesy to us if you're a prophet. Tell us who. Uh, and they're casting these insults upon him. And then this point happens where victory comes. He's reminded, you know, Jesus is reminded in his mind that just hours before, it's been one of the most traumatic times of uncertainty where he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Have you ever been at this point 
where that prophetic word that you've got, your, your business, your family, you're not sure if you're going to make it. That's where Jesus is just hours before. But now as he's standing before Pilate, something happens. They turn to him and they say, are you the son of God? Are you going to hold on to this delusion? You can barely stand. If you give this up, you'll surely walk away free. And our English translation doesn't do it service. In verse 70, Jesus turns to him and he says this. Our English translation is watered down. Jesus said, you better believe that I am. Come on, somebody. Will you have the courage and the ability to recognize your point of victory at that, at that moment? When things are dark, because that's where it begins. That's where you have to seize it by faith. Our Lord recognizes the tables are turned. The enemy has overplayed his hand. They've done, he's, they've done the very thing that he was waiting for. They're crucifying for the forgiveness of sins of the entire world. That's what victory looked like. Only a small group can recognize it. Listen to this, my friends. Fewer still can realize the struggle was for a purpose. Ladies, put your eyes up here. The struggle with your husband is for a purpose. Men, you know, that, that struggle with your boss, can you find the redeeming narrative in it? Are we going to live as victims? If she'd only change, if he always makes me angry, if my boss would just recognize me, always putting that out there, but realizing that God and God alone has the ability to take my story it and turn it into a redemptive narrative. I want to talk to you about Joseph. Genesis 45 through 48. I'm not going to go through the scriptures. You can read them later. Uh, you may have the notes with you. But Joseph is a young man. He's naive he shares his God-given dream with his brothers, and he's expecting counsel, support, nurturing. Instead, he's met with the same thing that every man and woman of God who is pursuing their destiny is met with. They're met with jealousy. They're met with insecurity. They're met with rebuttal. Even as he's pursuing God, his life becomes a series of ever-increasing tragedies. You know the story. He's sold into slavery. He's uh, put in the pit. But the enemy begins to do the most sadistic play in his life. You see, the enemy realizes that every human being has the ability to kind of stand up under this daunting imprisonment. He's looking for a deeper blow. And what he does to Joseph is indicative of oftentimes what he does to us on our way to victory. He offers Joseph release. And just as he's at the cup, he pulls the rug out from under him because he's looking to dash his hope. You remember the story? He uh, gets uh, in Potiphar's house. He's faithful. He's serving. Come on, somebody. Leadership recognizes him. He's on his way up. And just when he starts to believe in his heart that maybe something is gonna, good is going to happen, there's some fulfillment coming out of it, he's dashed and thrown back into prison by the act of one adulterous woman. Right when he's ready to come out. Somebody's turning the corner right now. Somebody's saying he's talking to me. That job promotion that you got looked over for, is there a redemptive narrative in it? He's thrown back into prison. He's there. He's suffering. I mean, you know, think of it. He just hopes, dash, dream. But he still believes the promises of God over his life are in effect. He refuses to give up. He's not going down. He's going up. His prophetic gifting starts to make a way for him. He's prophesying. He's dr his dream interpretation make a way. He's promised uh, by the people around him, we're getting free. We're going to remember you. We're going to set you free. And as soon as they're out, they forget all about him, and he's back in prison again. 
But come on, somebody. Let's give the Lord a hand because his promises never fail. His mercies are new every morning. Though others will be faithless, he is faithful. He's willing to be trusted. He's not a man that he can change his mind. He will not repent. His promises for you are yes and amen. And Joseph goes in one season from the lowest of the low to the number one position in all the free world. Somebody needs to hear that today. Come on, I want to repeat it. He goes from the lowest of the low in one season to the highest position in the free world because of the promises of God over his life. Now listen to this. Many people uh, uh, can see victory when it comes. Few can recognize it as its inception. Few can hold on to it. But even fewer still can believe that this narrative, this struggle that he went through was for a purpose. Think about it. The thing that he went through was for a purpose. And Joseph realized that which of us, when it comes our turn to be on top, come on somebody. And now Joseph is faced with a situation where he's in complete control, he's absolutely justified, and the perpetrators that put him in that prison stand before him, and he has every right, morally uh, and, and just, justly, to uh, enact vengeance on them. And listen to what he says to the very people that threw him in prison. Don't be distressed, don't be angry with yourselves. How many of us, he's definitely not from New Jersey. He's not from New York. We will remember, we'll remember the pain you inflicted. Come on, somebody. But look at Joseph. He realizes that whole story, that whole redemptive narrative was for a purpose. Can you recognize that now at the moment of inception in your victory? Can you say with me, God, all that you've taken me through has prepared me for this. Look at what Joseph says. He says, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He did this for a purpose in my life. Come on, somebody. What about America? America the beautiful. The land of the free and the home of the brave all the prophecies we've heard about this country, the people that have uh, for generations been sacrificing, some of them giving their lives in ultimate patriotism. We've been a light to the rest of the world. I'm not saying America's perfect, but God help this world if it wasn't for our standing for justice. Standing under the principles, now we don't get it right every time, but we're standing under the principles that all men are created equal. All have a right to practice their religion and their, with freedom. They we're founded, the only nation on the earth, founded under the premise that God is sovereign over man and man is sovereign over government. Now, at every turn, every time I turn around, yet there's another assault uh, from men and women denying the power of God that got us to this place, r denying the grace that saved us, literally wringing their, their hands, showing their fist at God. All the time, the money in their pocket says, in God we trust. What about America? Could it be that we're at the point of redemption? Could it be like when Jesus stood before Pilate, it might not look like it. It looked like he was beaten down. It looked like he couldn't take another breath. But Jesus stands up in faith and he recognizes that this is the turning point. This is what was prophesied from the foundation of the earth. That he would be slain for your sin and my sin. That he would be wounded and chastised for my peace. What about America? Can we look at it right now and say, God, this is the turning point for America. We refuse to go any further now. We'll not go any further down that road. We're going to pray that this country turn out to be what it was prophesied to be. And what about if, like 
um, Churchill uh, prophesied when he was speaking as a statesman for England. I love this part. He was talking this speech after the Battle of France. What if America, if we take out England and we assert America here, let us brace ourselves and so bear ourselves that if the USA should last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. This is when we defeated racism. This is when we put God back on the throne. This is when we found out the redemptive narrative of what happens when a nation turns its back on God that right now could be the redemptive narrative for America. Many will jump on that bandwagon when victory is complete. Let me turn the corner here, my friends. What about you personally? I want to bring this down to personal, practical application. Hear me, what hardships have you been through? What markings and scourgings have you had to endure to keep the gospel lifted high? Has it been a while since you took your sword out of its sheath? Has it grown rusty? You may, be, you may have been living in one of the most deadly prisons known to man and not realizing it. The prison that slow and methodic seldom noticed the dungeon of mediocrity and lethargy. Where just everybody and everything around you is just easing you, sedating you, not to believe those promises of God for your life. It's that slow, methodic, ebbing away at your faith. Maybe you've been in that prison. Can you recognize today that this is the moment of inception for your turnaround story? And even more, can you recognize that struggle was for a purpose? You may be right now writing the biggest turnaround story ever. One that makes Rocky Balboa pale in comparison. You know, that story where right now they'll look back 10 years on your life and they'll say that is the moment that he or she started to stand up and believe the promises of God and lay hold of those things. And their life turned on a dime and they were thrust into the narrative that propelled them into their destiny you got to bring it in by faith turn to someone say you got to bring it in by faith you can rise above the current situation be one of the few that recognize your place in history that you're prepared for this moment that you have a purpose a destiny an assignment and regardless of what your current situation looks like this can be the moment of turnaround you're destined for victory. I just want to tell you, listen, we're not here to survive. We're here to take over. That's what we're born for. We're not just going to get by. We're, we're triumphing in the Lord. He always leads us in triumph. Can you say with me that no matter how bad the situation looks in my life, that it will turn around for the best without any other indication, solely because you know the nature of God, that he is a good God who loves you, and that he can change every setback and turn it into a victory. How close were you to coming up, or to giving up before your breakthrough came? Some of the greatest figures in the Bible, I don't have time to go into it, but... Abraham, Moses, David had to wait for many, many years for God's promises to be fulfilled. And everything, hear me out, sister, brother, everything that happened in meantime was used to prepare them inwardly and outwardly so that when they received the promises, they were blessed beyond measure. You know, I just want to say that this, this narrative that sees our struggles and our prisons as part of God's process is the thing that separates high-impact people from the rest of the world. Two people get up and they experience the same situation. There's a flat tire on their car. One person gets up and says, God hates me. 
His judgment is upon me. You know, everything keeps going wrong for me. There's nothing that I can hope, and now I've got this flat tire. Another person stands up, the exact same situation, and says, boy, am I glad that didn't happen on the highway last night. Boy, am I glad my kids weren't with me last night. It was raining. At least now I'm here in the driveway. And you know what? Maybe I'll meet somebody that's part of my destiny at the place, the AAA, that gets my tire fixed. And this will give me an opportunity to talk with my boss. I have to go in late. I'll talk with them. Everybody Everybody gets a flat tire. You, you get it? Turning that redemptive narrative is what heroes do. It's what high-impact people do. If you start reigning and giving your authority to over other people, oh, it's always she that makes me mad. Can she really make you mad? I know it feels like it, man. I know. <laughs> no, my wife, my wife is here. I've got to settle down now. It's disempowering for me to say things like, my, my husband or my wife always makes me angry because I'm turning my ability over to them. Can they really reach inside of me and tweak my adrenal gland and my hippocampus or whatever it is? No, always between stimulus and response, I have a choice. I have a choice. You have a choice. Somebody's given up their crutch right now. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound. You know what? Let's say this one together. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles or your cell phones or you can turn on this page. But let's, this, word, this, this phrase is just dripping with the power of God. Let's say it together. Let's just, let's just read this. Uh, let God hear it from your lips. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. I think it's up on the screen if you can see it. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you have an abundance for every good work. Tell me that that is not the nature of our God. He loves you, he loves you. I want to finish up with three practical steps that you can take to ensure then in the moment of inception, you realize it and you act appropriately. The first is that you have to have a, tr a transcendent cause something bigger than yourself. You can live life in frustration. You can miss opportunities if all you're doing is preparing for your retirement, worrying about how many people are on Facebook or Twitter, just uh, your next uh, job assignment. It's all about me, me, me. That will never get you into the kingdom of God because God has something bigger for you. He has a transcendent cause. There are other people right now waiting for you to come into your fullness. You know how I know that? It says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So the people are waiting for the righteous to rule so that they can rejoice. They're waiting for you. People are waiting. Come on, somebody. They're waiting for that book that's inside of you. They're waiting for that ministry that, that you've, you've had in the back of your heart. They're waiting for you to take your, your spot and open that new business or be the employee of the month or whatever that thing is, that transcendent cause beyond you. People are waiting for you to come in your assignment. Number two, you have to hold on to hope. This was the thing that the enemy was after and trying to sadistically keep pulling the rug out from Joseph. He was after something bigger. He, he knew he couldn't keep him down. He knew he couldn't take his, his assignment away from him. He wanted him to give it up himself. He wanted him to give up hope in that thing that he was praying for. Listen to this in Hebrews. Uh, it says this in 1035. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what is promised. That word uh, throw away or cast aside, it might say in your King James Version, comes from this Greek word. It means to throw away like a shield in the time of the hottest battle. You throw it away so that you can get a hasty retreat. Come on, turn to someone and say, we're not made for that kind of behavior. That is unacceptable. I am not going to throw away my shield of faith when it's deepest, darkest battle. I'm going to hold on to that thing. Listen to what it says. Neither men nor devils can take it from you, and God will not deprive you of it. 
If you don't give up, God's not going to give up. Neither men nor devils can take it from you, and God will not deprive you of it. This is your shield, your faith in Christ, which gives you knowledge of salvation. Keep it, and it will keep you, Adam Clark said. Now the, the third one. This is the one that the Lord's been dealing with me. These three practical steps so that you can recognize and take action in the moment of inception and victory. Step number three, don't constrict your supply line with fear, anxiety, worry, and doubt. I want to tell you, in this season of my life, just to be transparent, this is the biggest one that God has been speaking to me. A, a preacher I know had a vision Imagine this with me. He saw from heaven golden tubes, golden uh, pipes coming down from heaven on every believer. And they had uh, golden glory, golden grace for every area of life, for your family, for provision for your household, for your marriage. It had answers for your loved ones. Can you, can you feel it? Can you sense it? God dropping in just the right word at the right time, pers- uh, you know, causing you to go from glory to glory, these golden tubes coming down. But then he saw as soon as that believer would enter into worry, fear, anxiety, and doubt, those supply lines began to be constricted. They were cutting him off from the very flow of the glory of God coming down in his life, his or her life. Come on, somebody. At the very time our breakthrough is coming, at the very time we need help from God, I get it. Worry, fear, anxiety, and doubt, we don't talk about it a lot, but they're hidden reefs. They are dangerous, They're seldom noticed. We don't point them out in our list of sins, but they will cripple you. And more importantly, they'll constrict that supply line that comes down from heaven. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you. That all, so that you'll have, listen to this, it's amazing. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed. I love that. That is that golden grace of heaven, that supply line coming down for your life. Lord, I don't know what to do. That son or daughter of mine is beyond your control. Let it go. Don't have worry, fear, anxiety, and doubt. Turn it over to God and see if his not, his golden grace will start to come down from heaven over that situation. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it through with this business. I don't know how I'm going to make the bills next month. I know that it seems natural to live in worry, fear, anxiety, and doubt, but let it go and trust God and see if that golden pipe from heaven doesn't start to open up over the very thing that you're waiting for. God, how am I going to fulfill this ministry? How am I going to write this book? Let it go. Open it up. Get rid of worry, fear, anxiety, and doubt, and see if that golden glory, that grace of God, doesn't come down over that area of life. When we stop that nonsense and stop complaining and see if God doesn't fulfill that promise he has for us. I'm wondering... If you would, uh, I, don't, I don't ask you to do this much, but I'm wondering if you would stand with me and we can make some declarations together. On uh, just a moment, I'm going to bring Tom up and we're going to have time at our tables to pray this through. I, I, I want to make sure that I end uh, uh, promptly so that you have time, but let's make some declarations together, amen? I wonder if this has been for someone here today or someone watching us by TV, if you needed to hear this word. God has put you here today so that you realize that in your uh, time, your darkest time, that you can see that victory is coming. Let's make a strong declaration first for our country. You can just kind of pray on your own and start praying in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to just lead a few phrases, but let's, let's just believe this together. Come on, just, just enter in with me. God, we pray for our country. Lord, we pray that righteous men and women would be at the helm of this country. Lord, we pray for those leaders that are in authority, that, Lord, the grace of God would change them. Lord, we're not going to complain. Lord, we're going to believe that this is the time of turnaround for America. 
Lord, that this is the time of grace for our country. Lord, that racism is defeated, poverty is defeated. Uh, Lord, all these, these uh, things that we've seen, Lord, this is the moment of change. I want to pray for our congregation. If you're part of Morningstar, you're, you're praying for this congregation. If you're watching us uh, by TV or if you're part of another congregation, just put your, you know, insert your congregation. Father, we thank you for this congregation, Lord. We thank you for the grace of God, Lord. We believe that you've raised us up to say a strong word to these nation, this, in this time to this nation, to the nations around the world, that Morningstar will be used, Lord God. This congregation will be used. They'll be known around the world for strong believers who preach the truth, who triumph, who overcome tragedy, Lord God, that right now you're sending men and women from this place to release those books, those ministries, those businesses, Lord, that this is the day of turnaround that people are going to look back at this moment and say, this is when it started for Morningstar in Jesus' name. And now for yourself, maybe you can put your hand on your heart or if you want to pray for someone around you, for ourselves individually. It's okay to be selfish right now. Lord, I pray that that transcendent cause will be stirred up in each individual here and those that are watching, Lord. The thing that they were made for, Lord. Their true assignment, Lord God. It might have gotten lost. It might have gotten buried under hurt and pain. Lord, right now, dig it out. Lord, dig it out. Maybe it's called to be an intercessor, a book, or maybe there's a business to be birthed. Lord God, bring out that transcendent cause, that thing that goes beyond us, that thing that we're created for, that thing that fulfills us, Lord, that fills us with passion and vision, Lord. Right now, unlock it in Jesus' name. All around this uh, uh, this auditorium here, Lord, and those that are watching, unlock it. Right now, let it pop right in your mind. Let it come. Don't don't hold back. Let God put that in there. Lord, and we choose to hold on to hope. Lord God, Lord, we refuse to let our narrative be self uh, to be unempowering, Lord. We choose to believe that everything that you've brought us through. Come on somebody, let it go. Everything you brought us through to this day, no matter if we understand it, if, if we think it's unjust, we choose to believe that it's prepared us for our assignment right now. And Lord, we refuse to constrict your supply lines right now with fear, anxiety, worry, and doubt. Hear me just for a second. As I was preparing, I believe the Lord said to me that some of us have a plan B and you need to tear that up today. You know, so what does that look like? Maybe you've been fighting with your, your husband or your wife for some time and you, you started to think, you know, maybe it's time to throw in the towel. That's plan B. Or maybe it's, you know, uh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave this ministry. No one, no one recognizes me. Or it could be one of a hundred narratives. But what happens is the devil subtly starts speaking and you're developing a, a, a narrative that is less than God's absolute best for you. Right now in the spirit, tear it up. Tear it up. Do not carry around in your back pocket plan B. There is no retreat in the kingdom of God. There's only forward movement. Lord, we refuse to constrict our supply line any longer. We recognize fear, anxiety, worry, and doubt as devilish schemes, Lord. And Lord, those people that try to come around us and fill our mind, Lord, with uh, negativity and thoughts about other people, Lord, we rebuke that in Jesus' name. We will not let our ears be their dumping ground any longer, Lord God. We recognize that stuff as sin, fear, anxiety, worry, and doubt broken over you right now in the name of Jesus. And now, like a watershed, let that heavenly flow of his grace come upon you. Just soak in it for a minute. Lord, those supply lines that were clogged before are now opened up in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord God. As we continue to move forward, Lord God, we believe that worry, anxiety, fear, and doubt, we're going to recognize this moment of inception of our personal victorious story, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Give God a hand. And I believe Tom is coming up.
Amen. Powerful, powerful moments here. Julie has a, something she's going to share with you. Thank you. Oh, Dave, that just undid me. That was amazing. <gasps> amazing. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. 